going to tell you a story about a little boy named Brooke Hopkins, who grew up to be a college professor. And then he moved to Utah, where he fell in love. And so did I. His field was um, English literature, especially the uh, romantic poets, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Keats, Keats, Shelley. And my field was bioethics, the study of philosophy and issues about end of life in particular. So pulling the plug, euthanasia, suicide, physician-assisted dying, choices about dying. We talked about these things a lot as we traveled. We had a nice life together. We trekked. We relaxed in cafes all over the world. And as we did that, we talked about romantic poetry, about end-of-life issues, and of course about a great many other things. Right? What we didn't know, though, as we talked, although we both knew that we would die someday, we didn't know what a contemporary book, death, Brooke, would die. It wasn't going to be one of those old-fashioned deaths, the kind in which death courts you, follows you at every moment, when deaths are primarily deaths of infectious and parasitic diseases, deaths at any moment in the lifespan, deaths that are unpredictable in uh, their general outlines uh, and when they occur, and deaths in which the physician can't do very much at all to stave them off except to comfort. Deaths of plague, deaths of infection. This is George Washington, who in December of uh, 1799 went out inspecting his properties on horseback, caught a cold, it was rainy, cold December, and was dead in two days of infection. In the contemporary world we live in, in the developed world, deaths like this almost never happen where there's access to adequate medical care. In just a little over a century, we have moved since about the 1850s from deaths that were primarily deaths from infectious and parasitic diseases, um, which were most of them comparatively rapid, unpredictable, and could occur at any time in the lifespan, to deaths which are predictable, more or less, long sustained, right, and which the doctor can do a great deal to shape and postpone. Deaths in what epidemiologists call the age of delayed degenerative diseases. They occur late in life and have shapes like this. The top one is cancer. Not all cancer deaths look quite like this, but this is the general pattern of deaths with, which are typically diagnosed months, even years in advance, um, and in which there is a relatively good quality of life until a comparatively steep tail off. Or deaths from organ, heart, and other organ failure, in which there's a pattern of exacerbation and remission trending downwards that ends in death, also typically over an extended period of time. Or deaths from the various dementias, including Alzheimer's, in which there is typically a much lower level of function, but that extends over a period of time, sometimes as long as a decade. These are the deaths that we die now. They are slow deaths, right? Acute deaths from unexpected causes are a minority of deaths in our uh, developed world. And while there's a little uptick in infectious disease, that's modest compared to the frequency of deaths like this. This is what awaits us. Now, there are a lot of ways we can 
um, try to understand this, but one thing that Brooke and I, as we talked about it so often, um, uh, recognized was that this new pattern of dying didn't mesh very well with the religious, cultural, uh, and political assumptions that came from a much earlier period. Uh, claims like dying is in God's hands, or it's your time, or que sera, sera, or death should be natural. We shouldn't do anything to interfere with natural dying. Or you'll know when your time is up. Right? Those phrases don't mesh with the way we actually respond to these new, slower deaths. What do we do? Well, we issue DNR orders, do not resuscitate orders. We withhold or withdraw treatment. We use heavy doses of opioids and other kinds of pain medication, understanding, though not intending, that this may hasten death. This is legally recognized in this country. We withhold artificial nutrition and hydration right, when it seems that death is imminent. Right. More recently, there's some, I think you might call it vogue for um, stopping eating and drinking on the part of the patient. Right. We sometimes resort to terminal sedation. This goes by a number of names, extended palliative sedation, um, and many other euphemisms, but they all describe a practice of sedating into um, unconsciousness or close to it or even into comparative coma, a patient <clears throat> whose symptoms are otherwise intractable and who is nearing death. These are the ways that we now deal with the extended deaths that we die. And in some places in the world, it is even now legally permitted for physicians to aid dying patients in dying. Right? In this country, physician-aided dying, called physician-assisted suicide by its detractors and physician-aided uh, dying by its proponents, right? is legally possible now in four states in this country, Oregon, Washington, Vermont, and Montana, uh, and in a number of European countries as well, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, and there's a controversial picture in Germany. You'll see on the right-hand slide that, um, that depicts the spread of right-to-die societies around the world. And one thing you notice is that these are primarily in the developed countries, right? This is a problem of our luxurious healthcare and um, general economic situation. This is the way we in the privileged parts of the world die. Then something happened. Brooke went for his usual bike ride one crisp, lovely November afternoon. I often went with him, but this day he went uh, by himself. And as he was coming downhill on his bicycle, uphill was coming a bike racer doing sprints, and they collided around a blind curve. The other guy wasn't hurt, he was just tossed off his bike, but Brooke broke his neck. And just by chance, there was, jogging down the hill behind him, a fully trained flight nurse specializing in respiratory therapy who saved his life. Later, when we met her in the hospital, she said, I've always wondered if I did the right thing, since after all, she knew that he would be paralyzed for life and that he would almost certainly be on a ventilator for life. I always wondered if I did the right thing, she said. Well, he thanked her profusely from his hospital bed 
even though those things were proving to be true. Right? And indeed, although he required support for every bodily function from the neck down, right, just the same, he prized his life. He was glad to be alive. We had fun sometimes. After we came home, friends came to play in our backyard. They played music. We laughed. Right? We were able to go trail riding in the quite beautiful Utah foothills. Right? And he was even able, he was a college professor, right? Able to continue teaching courses. He taught courses at home of works with enormous intellectual impact content, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Divine Comedy, Shakespeare, and of course, the romantic poets that he'd always loved. Even more important, in a way, for both of us is that although we couldn't do any of the other activities we'd always done together, we learned to write together. My hands, you can see, are on the keyboard there. Uh, and we talked together as we composed an account of what it was like to be in this situation and to always keep in mind that this is only a tragedy if you make it that way. Our relationship and the intimacies in it moved from doing things together and, of course, sex, to a much deeper, more profound intimacy, so close that it is, I think, impossible to describe. He flourished in spite of pain, limitation, utter dependency. He flourished. And so did everyone around him who was close to him. But then things became more difficult. He had repeated infections. He had repeated pneumonias. He had pleural effusions. He had many other medical complications. And he knew that it was time to die. To die? To die? He had loved life. He was so glad he'd been rescued, in spite of the unimaginable limitations under which he lived. But he knew that things were downhill. He was powerless to stop them. So were all the rest of us. And so, He formed, over quite a long period of time, the conviction that it was time to die. He knew what he wanted, right? He wanted to be able to die when he was ready. He wanted to be able to die with the help of a physician. He wanted to be able to die without pain, without air hunger. He wanted to be able to die with his friends and his family around him. He wanted to die in peace. He knew exactly what he didn't want. He didn't want to die in a hospital, in that sterile, sometimes impersonal, and always protocol-governed environment. He absolutely did not want that. He knew what you needed was a physician who would listen to you who would understand you, who would serve, who would be your ally, your helpmeet, your friend in How to Die. He knew he was lucky. And he knew he was lucky because by this time he had five medical technologies that contributed to keeping him alive. He had a cardiac pacer. He had a diaphragm pacer. He had a feeding tube in the stomach. He had supplemental oxygen that was necessary 
much of the time, he had a ventilator. And he knew that he could have any one or all of these discontinued, even though he had accepted them initially. He knew the very fine line, because we had talked about this so often in all those years we'd spent traveling, trekking, sitting in cafes. He knew the very fine line between allowing to die and causing to die that's at the center of the right to die debates. He knew that his choice, as it became increasingly clearly and firmly his considered choice, he knew it would be difficult for his family, his friends, for me. I was the main foot dragger. This was unbelievably difficult to see someone you love so much form, reflect on, consider, make, and formally request this step. But on the other hand, when it's someone you love so much, you have to respect what they want. And we all knew that his choice would be easier for him than any of the alternative deaths he might die in the situation he was in. And he knew and kept reminding us, and we had to acknowledge that he had both the legal and moral right to make this choice, even though we lived in a state where assisted dying, in a state in a country in most of which assisted dying was not legal. He was asking for a death that one would think of as contemporary. A death not like those old medieval deaths where you're annihilated by some disease without much uh, warning. Also not like our current deaths, deaths with long downhill slopes in which one is essentially obliged to continue down much of that downhill slope. He wanted to be able to die given the extraordinarily difficult nature of his situation, to die on his own terms, which he did. This is the expression on his face, snapped at the very moment the hospice physician said, I will help you discontinue the ventilator. And so he did. And I lay in bed beside him. And I listened as they began to dial down the ventilator, administering drugs to control air hunger, pain, anxiety. As they dialed it down from 18 breaths a minute to 16, and then 16 breaths a minute to 14, and then 14 breaths a minute to 12, and then to 10, and I could hear the heart become irregular or slower, and I could hear the spacing between breaths slow and slow until there were long intervals in between. And I knew that one of them would be the last. And so ended a love affair that began almost 40 years ago.